we are now moving on to the last topic from me before Dr. Lim takes over and continues with the molecular spectroscopy. What we've been doing is spectroscopy involving atoms, eh? atomic species or ionic species. Okay, so mass spectrometry is still interaction of uh, with matter, you know, uh, interaction of some energy with matter, but now it no longer involves absorption of uh, electromagnetic radiation or emission. All this while when we were talking about atomic absorption, flame emission, graphite, AAS, uh, ICP, optical emission, you are looking at light. You are detecting the light being how much light has been absorbed or how much has been emitted. And we were looking at in the UV region, and in the visible okay but here we are talking about mass spectrometry as the name goes we are going to look at the species which are formed which are in the form of ions and you detect this different species having different masses okay so they are charged species having different masses and that's how you you would uh, make uh, some qualitative uh, identification what the species are okay through the mass to charge ratio okay we the each each ion will have a certain mass and uh, it will have a certain charge so we are going to look at the different masses according to their mass to charge ratio so what is this used for <coughs> so remember when you talk about mass you no longer talk about uh, absorbance or emission okay you're talking about how many how many species of a certain mass uh, it's used to not only do we're going to see how it's used in elemental analysis also it's used in organic inorganic and biological molecules getting information about their structure so you know an organic molecule and you want to know what it is so through the mass you then identify what the molecule, what the organic molecule could be. Are you doing organic right now? Are you looking at some mass spectrum? You know, your, if you have your IR spectrum, your UV vis and your mass spec, and how you use all this information to find out what the organic molecule will be. But our emphasis here will be more on what is the instrumentation used. And we will lead on to uh, talk about the configuration of uh, or the instrument that uh, mix that combines ICP and mass spec so that's why part of the reason why we want to do mass spectrometry so that we can lead on into ICP mass spec <coughs> uh, now it of course the instrument used is a mass spectrometer and the first thing that must happen is you must get the ions. You put in your sample, you must produce the ions. Only after producing the ions, you must have some way of separating the ions of different masses and detecting them. So the idea is the same, okay? Uh, in absorption or emission, you have light of different wavelengths, which are uh, characteristic of different elements, and you have your monochromator that separates the thing into different uh, wavelengths so that you can detect different wavelengths. Here you detect different ions of different masses. Okay. But still it must have some source of ions, some form of how you want to separate the ions, some kind of monochromator but not monochromator for light, some kind of uh, component that will separate the ions of different M and ultimately you must have a detector that can detect the ions. So the, I, the idea is the same, but it's just that it's now mass spectrometry. So the main components of a mass spectrometer, okay? So you must have how you want to introduce your sample, an inlet system. And if you notice, it's all in a vacuum, low pressure, because you cannot have too many ions. It's going to be difficult to separate them and difficult to detect them. So it's low 
low pressure, minimal, you know, very little number of ions. You're talking about 10 to the 5th to 10 to the 8th tor, okay? Not like what we were talking about AAS, up, uh, the plasma is all working at atmospheric pressure, no vacuum involved there. Here, so the sample must be introduced into an inlet system. Uh, and usually, most of the time, you have a sample that's volatile. So, you know, you have to form a gaseous form of the sample. Um, and, of course, there are other accessories where you can introduce uh, a, a solid, I suppose. But most of the time, it's a liquid. Okay, so you have a gaseous sample that then you get your ions form in the ion source. So, from here, and please bear in mind that this line is no longer talking about light. All this while when we draw ar arrows from one component to the other, we're talking about light. Okay? Light of different wavelengths. Here, you're talking about ions being transmitted from one component to the other. So, here you form your ions. It'll then go into a mass analyzer. Think of the mass analyzer as a monochromator. But now, the mass analyzer is used to separate the different uh, species, different ions, having different M. Or you talk about, now you talk about ions having different M to Z ratio, ma mass to charge ratio. And most of, it, most of the time, we're talking about plus one. Okay? So if Z is one, M to Z is basically the mass of the whole ion. So this now will separate uh, we can think about that, you know, one ion at a time will come out after it comes out through <coughs> after going through the mass analyzer, you get ions of different masses coming out and you have to have a detector. No longer can you use your detector of, you know, your photo multiplier tube or your <coughs> CID, CCD, you know, your semiconductor kind of detectors that use that you were used to you uh, detect light, UV or visible. Now you have to detect ions. Okay. But still, the transducer idea where you now translate one signal to another signal, some non-electrical signal to an electrical signal. So, you, ions will hit the detector and you'll get current or voltage or whatever. And ultimately, you will need some signal processor so that ultimately you will see the mass spectrum. Do we have a? Did I give any examples of a mass spectrum? I doubt it. Not in this place. Okay, you say in organic you've done some mass spectrometry. What what does a mass spectrum look like? All taken away. Oh my goodness. Who took all the markers away? He fell down. What does a mass spectrum look like? We see now remember, we are now looking at ions of different masses. Counting. You can think the detector as a counter. When an ion hits it, it counts one, but it will, so it, it basically is counting the ions, okay. So the mass spectrum will be, here will be mass, here will be basically counts, and you get your, you know, whatever, um, a mass spectrum, counts, number of, uh, the intensity here is no longer intensity of light, okay, please. Again, we're now moving on to mass spectrometry. Absorption, emission, mass spectrometry. Different, use different terminology now. Different mass to charge ratio, different ions of different masses, and how many of them. The higher the peak means more, more of those, that particular ions, okay? So here is just, uh, again, again showing the different components, the inlet, for sample introduction. 
So again, your, how you inject your sample, you're now in atmospheric pressure, you must now inject into something low pressure. So it's not going to be something in the open, you know, you have to like a septum or something where you inject your sample. Then you have your source region where ionization will occur, ionization of the gaseous sample will occur because you want to form ions. You have to form ions in order for you to ultimately detect what the, mass, uh, what, uh, the ions of different masses. The mass analyzer separate the different masses, and as we say here, all this is under vacuum system. You don't want too many ions, you know, colliding with one another and whatnot. You want, you know, minimal, minimal number of ions so that we can separate out and ultimately detect them. The detector basically counts the ions, and here you have your uh, data system in order to show you the mass spectrum. We have different ways of how to produce the ions. So here we are not talking about atomic mass spectrometry, but molecular. So this will, you know, this will be useful information for your organic or your inorganic, where you make use of mass spectrom uh, make, uh, mass spectrometry to elucidate this, the structure. Um, so how do you form the ions? Because the, when you inject, the thing is still in a, a gaseous form, molecular form, let's say. How do you get the different different ions of different masses? So uh, in the gas phase where the sample has formed a gas, okay, you have uh, different ways of forming ions through different mechanisms, electron impact, just from name. So that means you bombard the thing with electrons. Uh, or chemical ionization, some chemical reaction will occur to produce the ions. Field ionization is, uh, you know, using uh, electric field or whatnot to produce the ionization. So basically here is, when you say ion sources, different kinds of how the ions are formed. And I don't want to go into detail about about uh, that aspect, um, because we we are like I said, we are basically looking at the instrumentation, the different kind of mass spectrometers, and ultimately we want to go into ICP mass spec. Or if it's not in the gaseous phase, you have other forms of um, how you form the ions. You know, field desorption, many 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 ways of forming uh, ions. And if that's one thing good about having the text. If ever you need to know about any of these things, which you should be reading that particular chapter in preparation for your, for your general knowledge in case you, you need to go into a, a pharmaceutical industry that maybe, I don't know, uses Maldi or something, you want to know what Maldi is. I mean, that's the point of having that scoop. It covers pretty much you know, all these things if you want to know just the basics about the uh, method, about the technique. So, but ultimately, they're all mass spectrometry, different ways of producing ions. And here, to each, how the ions are formed, uh, on this column is shown the ionizing agent. So, if we just want to look at the first one, elect electron impact, like I told you, from the name, you know that energetic ions must be, electrons must be produced and they bombard the molecules to further break up the molecules into ions. Or chemical ionization uses a reagent, which are uh, gaseous ions. Field ionization uses a high potential electrode, and so on. All these other different kinds of how you produce ions. So basically, here is the ion sources. This part. Okay, how you form the ions. Then we go on to after the ions are formed. So if in a particular sample you have, um, if it's a mole molecular species, uh, you will have ions of different masses. Now you want to detect them. Of course, you need some way of separating them. And so this is where the... function of the mass analyzers, okay? Two separate ions of different masses. We are going to look at several mass analyzers. One, the magnetic sector. 
uh, double focusing, quadrupole, and time of flight. What we have at, at chemistry is the ICP mass spec, okay? And you also have your various GC mass spec, where you haven't done your GC yet, but maybe you've done some experiments. Gas chromatography in 243, who has done it? GC? Basically, what was the use of GC? Eh? Gas chromatography. You have a mixture, put it into the column and separate. Okay, so GC is a separation technique which you will do next semester. So now if we have GC mass spec, the GC, you have a mixture, it will come out, it will separate your compounds and come out one at a time. As it comes out one at a time, it will go into the mass spec and you, you get your spectrum of your individual uh, compounds that came out at different times. So there the GC mass spec is a combination of one is to separate, another one will be to find the, what is the mass spectrum of each component in that mixture. The one that, and we also have the ICP mass spec. ICP there, the function of the ICP there is not to do your analysis of your optical emission, uh, you know, to measure emission, like what we just discussed in emission spectroscopy. There, the ICP is used to produce the ions. Once you get the ions, you put it into the mass spec in order to detect the different masses, uh, you know, detect, count the ions at the different masses. So, you know, a combination, combination of different uh, techniques. So the mass analyzes the different, the one that we have is the quadrupole. And this, this is, I think most of the GC, GC mass specs are also based on this quadrupole. This is the more expensive magnetic sector or double focusing. Is that running? Are there aircon? But what's up? Put you at lower. 16 degrees. Okay? And time of flight. So, what are these different things? How you separate the different masses. The mechanism is different. Again, if you talk about resolution in emission or absorption, is uh, being able to identify uh, wavelengths that are very close to one another. Okay? Here, resolution is not wavelengths of light, being able to differentiate wavelengths that are close to one another. You're talking about masses now. Because you are counting masses. You are counting ions having different masses. When is it going to be a problem? How close will the mass uh, be, uh, the masses between two ions, how close can it be before the instrument says, cannot, they cannot differentiate. I cannot differentiate between Benjamin and... I haven't memorized your name. What's your surname? Lee, right? <laughs> Miss Lee. <laughs> because the masses are too close. So, the different mass analyzers that we saw just now have different resolution. Okay? So, it depends on, on your sample, uh, how close they must be. Um, did, we get, did you get a problem in the test about resolution? Wavelengths? No, no, but, but that can be a story also, okay? What's the resolution? What's the slit width that you need in order to resolve two lines which are very close? Again, the story, you know, the re the, the, there the resolution equation is lambda over delta lambda. Here, it's not lambda, but masses. So you'll be given two masses, they ask you, okay, can this, what instrument do you need to in order to be able to distinguish these two masses? two isotopes of bromine or two whatever, you know, where you're, when you talk about mass spectrometry, the masses are 180.126 and 180.101, you know, it's, it's something like that. It's not 180 and 185, it's those numbers after it, okay? So, this is how you uh, calculate the resolution <coughs> based on our mass. So, this would be the average mass masses of two ions that you want to look at the resolution. And uh, why is it as if it's not on? Okay, 
difference in the two masses. So that's how you calculate R. Okay, we now look at the first. Now we're going to look at the different mass analyzers. First one is the magnetic sector. And here, resolution is about equal or 2000, you know. Of course, this is not meant to be. Uh, you know the term carve in stone? When you carve in stone, can you change? When you carve something in stone, of course, I know you have not carved in stone, but if you were to able to carve your initial on stone, like my initial NM, can you change it once you have carved? You cannot, unless you know you take another stone or whatever. So now, when you say something like this, it's just to give an idea of you know what the resolution is. If you take another one instrument, it might not be 2000, but around that area, okay? Just so that we can make comparison between the mass analyzer of, uh, of a different type in terms of resolution. So magnetic sector, from the name, it must have some magnet. Okay, let's look at the, let's try to understand the um, diagram of the magnetic sector spectrometer given here. All the components must be there. That we, so you must know what are the main components of a mass spectrometer. There must be some source of ions, or how you put your sample in here, is the inlet gaseous sample. Here is the place where you call the ion source. Probably this uses electron impact source, I suppose. You have here, here a filament which has, uh, will produce ions and it will bombard the sample and that's how you get ionization occurring. Okay? So then the, these ions of different masses will then enter this um, channel where you have a magnetic field. So you have charged species going through a magnetic field and depending on the masses, they will follow different paths. That's what it's shown here, the three lines here. Different R. Charged species, different M, going through the same magnetic field. So some will go this way. Oh, this is a good, uh, this is a good analogy. Some will follow the right, some will go to the left, some can go all the way to the back. Okay? When the ones that go all the way to the back, you have an exit slit. So the, the masses, the ions can come out. Again, he, here you're not talking about light. You're talking about physically uh, an ion, okay? Physically, that one has to get out of the slit and hit some detector so that it can be counted. Then you have an ion collector or whatever, the detector, okay? So as we see, only ions of a certain path can get out. When the magnetic field is at a certain, uh, a certain strength, you talk about uh, field strength of the magnetic field. So if you change the, the strength of the magnetic field, then you get a different mass coming out. Okay, so, um, and that is how we will get mass, that's how we will detect ions of different masses. Just like the monochromator, how do you get light of different wavelengths coming out of the exit slit? Remember you have an entrance slit and an exit slit to the monochromator? How do you, what is it that you, what position or what component changes grating? Okay, when you are physically, you, you change some dial to change the wavelength or you set it on your uh, computer that you want different wavelength detected but what changes is actually the grating that will make different wavelengths go out of the exit slit coming in into the monochromator many wavelengths coming out at, at any one time is just one wavelength so it's same kind of idea here but it's just that you're not talking about light but physically talking about ions of different masses taking different paths which is what it's trying to show here. As the ion goes through the magnetic field, it will have for, uh, some forces on it that will make it go different paths, okay? Um, which is the... Here everybody knows this is the kinetic energy. So the ion coming in will have a certain kinetic energy. When it enters the magnetic field, it will be... a centripetal force will be... Uh, it will feel the centripetal force and this is 
then how it will relate to the applied magnetic field and so there has to be some balance between these two forces as it goes through that tube that channel okay that we showed just now so if you re rearrange the two equations when you have uh, equate uh, equate the centripetal force to the applied magnetic field we are going to get that this is the different masses and how it is dependent on one b the magnetic field the applied magnetic field and also the <coughs> uh, voltage okay assuming the voltage is now uh, the accelerating voltage is the same okay so what we see now is how do we now get different the <coughs> masses to have different r or if we had gone back here this is a fixed r so the one that will come out through the slit must have a fixed r so how do you get the different masses to have that r so r is fixed okay how do you get different m to have the same r by changing b so by r is fixed v is fixed at different b you'll get different masses having that r does it does everybody understand that the the ions must get through one window it must follow this path and nothing else if it goes to the right it won't go out it cannot go out it cannot be detected so in order for it to be detected it must follow this this r okay so the r is fixed but you want at one time you want mass 20 another time you want mass 22 another time you want mass 23 going out of the same window same r so why, what must you vary b Okay, this equation says this must be equal to this so r and v are fixed at a certain b a certain m will have r you change b another m will have r okay so that's one way of how this magnetic sector works by varying b okay by changing b we get ions of different m to come out one at a time to come out with that certain R. Of course, here is another ver version where you, you change the accelerating voltage. Going one step further, just now is just magnetic sector, ions ions what is this well i'm glad i'm not going to be in this room anymore <laughs> that's all from the name is now double focusing we want to make it the resolution higher okay so we still have the magnetic sector but together with that you also have now an electrostatic analyzer so in combination with the magnetic analyzer so again here you have your source of ions so here the ions are produced it now enters uh, the electrostatic analyzer before it enters the magnetic analyzer and so what is the function of this electrostatic uh, analyzer here bearing in mind that remember here as we've shown the resolution of the double focusing is more than the magnetic sector of course i didn't give any notes for we're supposed to go and look it up in the book let's let's look at uh, one one m one ion of one mass okay 
here we assume that if you have a certain mass, you, your kinetic energy is one value. And we see that how it's dependent, uh, the velocity or the energy, the kinetic energy is dependent on V. Okay, at a certain V, if you set the voltage at a certain, uh, a certain voltage, it should have a, a certain kinetic energy. Uh, but what happens is, um, we find that in the ion source, uh, one mass may have different, the kinetic energy might be slightly different. Okay? Although it has the same mass, but the energy, maybe there are three different, same mass, but the variation in ener kinetic energy. So it doesn't have one value, but it has a spread of values, just like uh, wavelength. We said, you know, ideally it should be one wavelength, but no, it's a peak a variation. So same kind of idea here, okay? You're talking about maybe, you're talking about now one mass, one value of M, should have one value of kinetic energy but now it has like a spread so due to that spread of kinetic energy the mass spectrum also will be have some sort of a, a width okay it's not one mass but a, a spread due to due to the uh, the different the different kinetic energy that each mass can have so that's the purpose of the electrostatic analyzer so that now it comes out with the same kinetic energy sort of you so you have you 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 don't have that variation only then it will enter the uh, magnetic analyzer so that's how you get your increased resolution when you have this double focusing electrostatic as well as uh, magnetic sector so like a, a double filter sort of you know you think of it that way now we move on to the third kind quadrupole quad means four so you have essentially four poles and what happens now is um, the ions will now go through the middle part between the four poles and these four poles are connected to RF radio frequency and DC voltage and they're going to be you know the ratio between RF and DC are going to be varied and the variation in the RF and DC is so that the ions will form some oscillating paths as it goes through those poles okay so this is what is shown by these blue things, these wiggly things. They are now oscillating uh, through the four poles. So what we find is at a certain setting, some will oscillate and not hit any of the poles and get through. Get through the hole at the end. But for some where the oscillation is uh, higher, it will hit the poles and it will be neutralized. So at any setting, only a certain mass will, ion with a certain mass will get through. So this is how it works. No grating, no upper involved, okay? Just four poles with the RF and DC voltage. So the idea, that's the whole idea that you're supposed to get. That at any setting, only one will get through. The rest will, you know, oscillate such that it will be neutralized. Hit the poles and never get out. So this is what you vary. The poles are fixed only the RF and the DC are varied such that at, uh, at any time, at any one time, the, at any setting, only one mass will be able to get through. You change this, another mass will get through and the others, the others will be, you know, hit the poles and be neutralized. So this is how the quadrupole mass analyzer works, okay, somewhat uh, so we go on from, uh, from the magnetic sector, the different masses have different R, the electrostatic to increase the resolution where you have double focusing, here you have the quadrupole. And I, I guess this is cheaper, that's why we, we always get the quadrupole. Most of the commercial instruments are quadrupole. Now we get to the last kind, although there are some others in the book. Uh, ion cycl cyclotron, etc, etc, you know, some which we're not going to get into. These are the basic ones. Time of flight, okay? 
time of flight okay i'm going to be flying in like 10 o'clock to kl something like that so this one where different people will have different time of they will fly at different time or arrive in kl at different time because i'm taking the you know the jet fighter or whatever and somebody else is just walking another person is taking the train okay you arrive in kl at different time so here the different masses will arrive at the detector at different time here you have your sample so you have your ionization source here to produce the ions you have a drift tube and at the end you have uh, some detector uh, where now what happens is the ions will have what is shown here okay l will be the length of the tube v will be the velocity of the ions so it will have different times compared uh, with respect to its masses different masses the heavier ones will arrive first or the lighter ones you have a fixed length they all have the same energy so the far the the heavier ones will have a lower velocity lower v arrive later lighter arrive first okay so their time of flight through the tube are different that's why the name comes time of flight the time that they fly through the the drift tube so they are separated in terms of the time at which they take to drift through the tube so this is a time of flight mass analyzer <coughs> after it's being separated so remember the mass analyzer uh, through the different kinds of mass analyzer basically you get the different masses coming out at different times uh, the time of flight uh, the quadrupole the double focusing the magnetic sector ultimately it has to be counted the ions coming out has to be counted the detector doesn't know is it uh, the whether it's uh, mass one mass two mass three it doesn't know all it knows is ion coming in it counts okay so that's how you need to have a mass analyzer so that at different times different masses will be will hit the detector and be counted so again the detectors are ion detectors nothing don't don't talk about photo multiplier tube or whatever okay please um, although the name maybe is somewhat similar one of the kinds of detectors used is an electron multiplier so you know that somehow the electrons must be produced the ions hit the detector electrons are produced electrons are multiplied okay like in the pmt pmt what happens photo multiplier tube light falls onto the detector and what is produced the basic the photo multiplier tube because you want light to be detected and you get electrical signal so light falls on the cathode and what are produced for the pmt ultimately if you want current to flow you must get what what must be produced current flow means what 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 is current flowing is what what is it electrons so somehow light must get electrons the detector in the pm the pmt light hits the detector electrons must be produced right the photo emissive cathode the electrons then the electrons will hit the many dynodes and be multiplied you get electron flow so you get current you must get electron flow here it's not the light hitting and producing electrons but positive ions the mechanism is ions hit something electrons produce and all multiplied and you have your faraday and your array transducers again array is what similar detectors in in side by side i don't go into much detail you can look at the diagram in the in the in your text thing you have some pictures of electron supply etc just 
to show um, some other configurations. Now we talk about tandem mass spec. Now it's MSMS, but you know, MSMS triple. You know, triple quadrupole. Not only one, triple. So that, you know, if you, you filter and you filter because maybe the, the molecule is quite complex. So you, you, when it forms the ions, you cannot identify. So you let it go through the filter, another quadrupole, another quadrupole, okay? To find to, so that you can uh, detect the ions, you can then identify what they are. So just to show uh, like a, a tandem aspect, still you have your ion source. Or ions produced, mass analyzer one, you just this coming through, the others are prevented from coming through. You have some cell where this particular is bombarded. Okay. The word skin. Skin. 
skin, skin something. So what you do is, and then you want to take the bubbles out. So you use a spoon, you skin the thing, so you stick the top. Okay? So here, this is the idea. The silver cone and the center cone is like a cone. It's just a very tiny hole, very, very tiny, less than a millimeter in diameter. There's a hole here. So that only a few of the ions will get through. So your sample, first it goes through the sample cone, you get a bit, then it goes to cone, gets another bit, then it goes to the Because remember this is in that you don't want that many ions to enter your water hole, your mass advisor, so you just skip a bit. A lot is produced in this year, but you just skip a bit. Okay. And hopefully that bit will be representative of your sample. So you have your ICP, so the function of the ICP here again is to produce the singly charged ions. And you then have your uh, mass spectrometer. You can have perhaps uh, a quarter hole or maybe some other some other kinds of mass analyzer to use the quarter hole. And like I said, this is used for element analysis. Low concentration relative compared to your AAS, your ICOS. We have that for the future here. Let's compare that. Here we have the electrothermal, the graphite, ICP emission, the quick mode, but this is the graphite AAS conduction. ICP OES emission, and then you have your ICP mass spec. So we compare this with this few uh, elements given here, if we look at the black one. Action limit. Who is doing this? For some, for some, you find that emission is lower. So for the ICP mass spec, the black one. So it's comparable. Some are comparable to the blue one. You know, some it depends on the element. Because the material may be easier, but it's lower. Black one. But actually, yes, as a class that can be for past period. That's why the semiconductor industries, where like uh, maybe I've mentioned it to you before, where the solvents that they use, the water they must use is must be you know ultra pure. You must have very little ions in your solvents or in your water. So how do they check that the water that they, they use is very, very pure, you know, all the ions have you know, minimum amount of ions for the solvents that you need. We need to use ICP mass spec because then we can go down to very low concentration.